Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our webinar. We're just going to hold on for a few minutes to make sure everybody can get into Zoom, and then we will go ahead and get started. Hey everyone, we have about a minute to go and we're just going to wait for about another minute to make sure everyone can get into the Zoom uh, virtual space and then we're going to go ahead and get started. And to everyone on Facebook Live, we will be getting started shortly also. We still have people coming in, so we're just going to give them um, one more minute. We're so excited to have you this Wednesday afternoon, and we will get started shortly. All right, our participant numbers are stabilizing, so we will go ahead and get started. My name is Erica Zambello, and I am the Communications Director for Audubon, Florida, and welcome to Ghost Orchids at Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. We're so happy to have you with us, both in Zoom and on Facebook Live. Uh, we're gonna get started shortly, but I just wanted to do a few housekeeping things. Because this group is so large, um, you're not able to have video or sound, but if you have questions, we definitely wanna hear them. At the bottom of your screen, if you're in uh, Zoom, you can see the little chat button. That's the best way to ask us questions. You can do it throughout the presentation or you can wait till the end, it's up to you. For everyone on Facebook Live, hello. We will um, take your questions via comment, so if you comment, we will get to your questions that way. And uh, these are all our, our panelists and I'm going to introduce them before, before we get everything going. Uh, Sally Stein is Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary's Director of Public Programs. Peter Houlihan and Max Stone are National Geographic Explorers and celebrated photographers. And both were instrumental in investigating the mysterious pollination of the ghost orchid. Finally, we have Dr. Sean Clem, our research director at Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, and she manages cutting edge science investigating hydrology, restoration, and more in the Western Everglades. So as I've mentioned, we will take your questions at the end, either via chat or Facebook comment. This is being recorded, so you can actually watch it anytime on Facebook after we're done, or we will be posting it a YouTube link to our Audubon Florida website. So without further ado, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to introduce you to Audubon's Corkscrew Response Sanctuary. We're located in the state of the Florida in the southwestern part of the state. Next slide. In um, Collier County, northern Collier County is where the sanctuary is located. And Collier County is in the western Everglades. So this map shows the sanctuary's boundaries um, which protects over 13,000 acres in northern Collier County. Um, the next slide will show you a more detailed map of the sanctuary. And here you can see highlighted in green toward the bottom of the red outline boundary of the sanctuary, um, the old growth forts. We have about 740 acres of old growth cypress trees found in the sanctuary. And of course the sanctuary is much bigger than just the old growth forest. Also on the slide, you can see in yellow, the boardwalk, which um, we have lots of school children, um, researchers, and about 100,000 visitors each year um, that usually visit the sanctuary. Next slide. So here's a picture of our boardwalk, and the next slide shows some of the visitors enjoying it. Um, and the next slide will show you the old growth forest. So the old growth forest at Corkscrew, like I said, we have about 740 acres of old growth trees. 
and um, the the swamp gets most of its water in the rainy season, which is in the summer. Um, in the summer, um, we get most of our rain and it fills the swamp up. Um, the next slide will show you what happens in the dry season though. And the dry season, the water levels drop. It doesn't rain as much that time of year. So slowly the water is receding. Um, you can see also here, there's more trees and different plants in the swamp than just the cypress trees. We have a, a huge number of variety of species of plants and some of them are very tropical, some are more temperate. <laughs> but the tropical species usually, usually do well due to the humidity and the warmer temperatures most of the year in Florida. But we do get some cold winters on occasion. So our next slide will show you another species found in the swamp. This is one of our endangered orchids called the clamshell orchid, one of the showier orchids that are found at Cork Street. Next slide. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with orchids, um, orchids are found um, all over the world. There's about 25,000 to 30,000 species found um, all over most areas of the world. Um, we're lucky in Florida to have such a huge variety of temperate and tropical species. But orchids, as you can see in this picture, have some distinct characteristics. Um, most of them are colorful and sometimes fragrant to attract pollinators. Um, and this one, this picture shows um, the structure of a Florida butterfly orchid. Um, the flower parts are in parts of three. There are three sepals, which are the remnant outer covering of the bud that becomes part of the flower. And then the three petals, with one of the petals that's highly modified that looks like the lip of the flower, most people call it the lip, also called the labellum. Um, above the lip, surrounded by part of the lip, um, is a structure called the column, and that houses the reproductive parts of the orchid. It's all combined into one unit, unlike most other flowers. So you can go on to the next slide. And so the next slide is the, I don't think it's advancing. I don't see it advancing anyway. But the next slide is a night scented orchid. And, oh no, it isn't, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, this just shows that there are terrestrial and epiphytic orchids found at Quartzu. Um, terrestrial orchids grow out of the ground. Epiphytic orchids grow on vines or tree branches in the sanctuary. These are two beautiful orchids. Um, the one on the right is an endangered Florida star orchid that was blooming just a couple of weeks ago. Okay, the next slide. This is a night-scented orchid, also another endangered species found at Cork Street. It's a beautiful flower. So Cork Street is home to about 25 species of native orchids, many of which are rare. You can see we have both endangered species, which are listed there, threatened species, and other ones that aren't either endangered or threatened. Next slide. And that leads us to the discussion of this talk, of this um, program, the ghost orchid. Um, our most famous orchid at Quartz Room is called the Super Ghost. And it was discovered in 2007. This isn't the only ghost orchid that's been found at Quartz Room. We had other ones here in the 1970s and 80s but nobody has found one since the 1980s. Um, so in, on July 7th of 2007, uh, we had four friends, three of which were former Audubon employees, um, Mike Duver and Jean McCollum, who were visiting the boardwalk with their friends, Marianne Biggers and John Ogden. And John Ogden was an Audubon employee who had worked on the Condor Project out in California. But um, Marianne and Jean were on the boardwalk and they were out near the Ed Carlson bench when they heard a barred owl calling. And they were looking up through the trees looking for the barred owl when Marianne said to Jean, I think I see a ghost orchid. And then Jean looked where she was looking and couldn't believe it. She said, I don't think they grow that high. But when she looked, it surely was a ghost orchid. And the others didn't believe it. They had to see it for themselves as well. So that's how our super ghost was found. At the time, it had seven flowers on it. Um, this picture was actually taken about a month after its discovery in 2007. It had nine flowers on it at that point. And this orchid has been um, 
a prolific bloomer. We, one year we had over 40 flowers produced by the plant. And um, it's now bloomed every single month of the year. It's also the highest growing goat's orchid that anyone knows. It's about 50 to 60 feet up in the tree. So it's pretty well protected up there. Um, and it is visible from the boardwalk. Um, when it's in bloom, it's the best time to see it. This is an epiphytic orchid and it's actually leafless. So it doesn't really show up very well unless it's bloom, um, which is probably why it took us 50 years to discover that orchid that had been there that long. All right, so now I'm going to turn this over to Peter. Thank you, Sally. Thanks everybody for tuning in. To really get into the pollination ecology and the complexity of the pollination of the ghost orchid, I'm going to take us back a little bit to the time of Charles Darwin and to an area far away from here in Madagascar very briefly. Here you see the rainforest canopy of Madagascar where 150 years ago Charles Darwin first wrote about the pollination ecology of orchids, the fertilization of orchids. And that's a book that came out in 1862 that many people don't realize because it was overshadowed in many respects by the origin of species. But um, as Sally explained in the next slide, um, in the tropics, about 80% of orchids are found in the rainforest canopy or in the tropical forest canopy, just like in corkscrew. And the next couple slides show some relatives of the ghost orchid in Madagascar. This is a group of orchids called angricoids, and they're predominantly found in Africa. But there are two genera, two groups of species that made their way to the Americas. Um, and, and that includes the ghost orchids. And um, the next slide shows another example. And here you see the long nectar tube that exists in these closely related species of orchids. But the one that really triggered this whole uh, hypothesis of the ghost orchid was one that Darwin was interested in in the next slide called the Madagascar star orchid, and Angraecum sesquipedale. And this one had a nectar tube so long that Darwin and his contemporary Alfred Russell Wallace were scheming what could possibly pollinate an orchid with a nectar tube this long. Surely, it, because of the coloration, the volatile compounds that are emitted by this orchid, um, and knowing that many orchids with these types of nectar tubes are pollinated by hawk moths, Darwin suspected in this book, The Fertilization of Orchids, that it must be a hawk moth that has a tongue over a foot long. And it wasn't until uh, after he passed away that finally a species that fit this description was found in Madagascar. And so this hypothesis that uh, Darwin schemed up is what had always been proliferated as the just so story for the ghost orchid in Florida. And when I first came to Florida and was working at the Florida Museum of Natural History, um, I was working on these orchids in Madagascar and that's what ultimately brought me to South Florida to work in the Everglades for this uh, next slide. You'll see our, our ghost orchid, Dendrophylax lindinii. And here you see also this nectar tube. And because of that, and because of these hypotheses that we call pollination syndromes, shapes and colors and smells combined that inform us of what likely pollinates flowers without us necessarily knowing for sure. It's always been conjecture. So the next slide you see um, ghost orchids are also found in Cuba. That's actually where they were first described in 1844. Um, and in South Florida, what we're talking about is um, is another population. And so um, the next slide shows the species that we always were told that people always talked about as being the only pollinator. Here on the trunk of this tree, you see a giant sphinx moth, Tisidius anteus, that as Mac and I were climbing through the uh, old cypress, old growth cypress canopy in corkscrew, Max spotted this one perfectly camouflaged on the trunk. And we got really excited because these moths are so rare, the orchids are so rare. And uh, as Mac will later show, this moth has a long proboscis of about six inches 
And it uh, has always been suspected by botanists primarily that this would be the only species that could possibly pollinate the ghost orchid. And so without getting into too much just yet, uh, I'm gonna show you or tee up Mac a little bit about what is actually entailed and we're going to reveal the um, unique discoveries that, that we encountered in, in chasing is this the pollinator? And so the next slide shows the process and the perspective of climbing into the cypress canopy at Corkscrew Swamp. Um, and not only are these epiphytic orchids um, that grow high in the trees, we're in a flooded forest. And the next slide also shows that these are being pollinated at night. So there are many compounding factors of climbing, wading into the swamp at night, using electronics, hauling them up in the trees. And Mac is now going to explain a little bit about the behind the scenes of the, the tech approach and, and what is entailed in this. Thanks, Peter. Thank you all for joining in. Um, I think it's, it's fair to say that everyone or anyone who's actually had a chance to see a ghost orchid up close and personal uh, is immediately transformed by it. It's just such a unique flower, such a unique orchid. And, and usually seeing these in the wild uh, generally inspires, inspires some sort or requires some sort of adventure. And that's how it was for me in my first time getting to see one in Big Cypress with uh, Chris Evans and Mario Cisneros who took me out into this braided slough to see my first one. And it was there while I was working on my, uh, my book on the Everglades because I needed an image of this ghost orchid and they're not easy to come by. And so um, while I was there, they told me about how difficult uh, it is they are to find and also um, about the pollination ecology of these orchids and how it was suspected that there's only one moth species that could pollinate it, but no one has been able to prove it. And so that really got the gears uh, turning in my head and started imagining ways that I might be able to photograph this, kind of combine my talents with the need to know uh, what might be able to pollinate this orchid. Next slide, please. And so I let that simmer for a little while and started brainstorming how to do it. And it, it just so happened that it aligned with another project I was working on about documenting the remaining old growth swamps left in the country. And one of those, one of the most fascinating ones is in Corkscrew, is in the Everglades. And as Peter said, so much of the botanical life exists up in the canopies of these trees, which is what got me so interested uh, in corkscrew. Next slide, please. And it's because in these canopies, in these 500-year-old trees, in these 400-year-old trees, where the canopy has never been disturbed by people, you find all kinds of epiphytic life, and ghost orchids in particular. The super ghost lives in corkscrew. So this is like a perfect merging of, of projects and something I'd long wanted to do. And so the way to do this and the way to embark upon it, I thought, was to try and use what's called camera traps. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? And camera traps are really fun and, uh, and frustrating uh, tools. Uh, normally, we use them uh, in the field uh, to photograph wildlife, uh, things like you know, raccoons or bears or uh, panthers. And it's a really cool contraption. It's just a homemade like pelican box or something that you put a camera you don't care that much about. You put that inside it because you're going to leave it out in the field for months at a time. And then you hook that camera up to a sensor. And that sensor, when animals pass that sensor and go in front of it, it detects the motion and it detects the heat of the animal. It'll then fire the camera. So next slide. So this, uh, this camera trap was set for otters. And so these are the types of images you generally get. Now, you know, an otter is, is big. It's a lot of heat and a lot of motion. And so it's quite different to trying to photograph a moth. Uh, and particularly a moth that is going to try to pollinate an orchid 15 feet up in the tree. So to embark on this, uh, it called up Peter. Next slide, please. And we started thinking about ways of, of exploring this forest, this old growth forest. And, you know, there's no old growth swamps left in the Everglades except corkscrew. So this is truly a relic of how the Everglades used to look. And what's really cool about these canopies is once you get in them, uh, next slide please, uh, once you get 
and climb up 50, 90, 100 feet up in these canopies, you see the way the landscape has really transformed them. A lot of these cypress trees have been topped by hurricanes and big storms. And so when they get topped, they then start to spider out. And, you know, Peter is, is not a small guy. And here he is just lounging, hanging out in the crotch of this old 500 year old tree. But what's really cool, next slide please, is that you see in the tops of these canopies that a whole second forest exists. Just limbs covered in epiphytes, covered in resurrection ferns, tillandsia and orchids. And so you start thinking of, wow, you know, maybe this is the way that all the ghost orchids used to be. Maybe they used to be at these canopy levels and this is how uh, the ecology of this, of this landscape used to look uh, before we cut down all the trees and corkscrew is just such a perfect example of that. So bringing all these, uh, all these things to bear, the camera traps and the technology and the tree climbing, next slide please. Uh, we rigged up a camera trap up in, up in the ghost orchid tree which uh, was difficult, it was fun. Uh, I hired an engineer, uh, Tony Cayazzo, to build a, a steel arm so I didn't have to uh, mar the tree in any way and I could mount all my equipment to it. And so there I have my camera trap, uh, where my camera is in two strokes and then the sensor coming out. Uh, and the goal was to try and, of course, photograph and wait for a moth to fly in front of that sensor. And so we left it up there from June through uh, the beginning of October, essentially. I mean, months just sitting there waiting and, and photographing anything that would pass by. It would rain, of course, so lots of false triggers, thousands of hours uh, of it recording and trying to capture something. And during this time, we also wanted to understand what kind of uh, nocturnal life exists in the swamps. Next slide, please. So. Peter and I would go out and we would set up light traps uh, that would, and light traps are, are as a tool that entomologists use to attract nocturnal insects uh, like moths, like hawk moths, uh, to this sheet uh, essentially to understand the, the composition, the entomological composition of the forest. And so there's Peter just looking glorious uh, in, front of his, uh, in front of his light trap as a very typical uh, summer storm rolls through the Everglades. And we tried it down on the boardwalk. Next slide, please. We, we even put it 90 feet up in a cypress tree uh, to see if anything would come. Turns out only mosquitoes came and uh, swarmed all over Peter, but there he is. Um, you know, trying anyway. And that's what this is all about. And finally, we did actually get a, a chance to see the, uh, the great hero uh, that we thought of this story, which was the giant sphinx moth. One just flew in it's, and it just sounded like a jet, like flying, just like you could hear its wings just go flap. And it nailed the sheet and Peter hopped on it. And we were just so excited because it's like, you know, here it is, okay like this could happen. One of these moths could actually pollinate this flower. And so uh, towards the end of, of this journey, which was a lot of very late nights, a lot of uh, sweaty afternoons and sweaty evenings, staying up very late and changing camera batteries and strobe batteries 50 feet up, getting nauseated because trees sway. And <laughs> if you get seasick like me, then it's a problem 50 feet up. But finally, at the end of this, we ended up uh, getting the image that, that we all hoped we would get. Next slide, please. Which is a giant sphinx moth right in front of the super ghost. And it was just one of those moments where, you know, we hugged at the base of the tree. Peter and I were just so excited just to be able to see this, you know, something that people haven't been able to see for, for decades. And then also there's a little fun, fun fact here. If y'all are looking very close at this screen, if you look to the left side of that tree, you'll see there's a little hidden gecko there just hanging out right by the flower too. But with that, I won't go any further. I'm gonna turn it back over to Peter who can help explain uh, some of the significance of this. Thank you, sir. So as Mac was explaining, uh, whenever we would check the cameras, we'd climb up, swap out memory cards, change out batteries, and then go back and, and really look at these photos. And we, we thought that this was it, you know? We, we documented exactly what we were anticipating. And as we looked closer in some of these photos, this giant sphinx moth is so large, the proboscis, the tongue on this moth is so long, 
that we were realizing the face of the moth isn't actually coming into contact with the flower. And so it's able to feed on the nectar of the flower without possibly providing a benefit by extracting the pollinia from the flower. And as we looked even closer, we noticed that there was pollen from a different species. There are only a few species of nocturnally pollinated flowers in this area, and one of them is a moon vine. And as we were looking at the head of this moth and the proboscis, it looked like that was what it had been feeding on previously. And here, it may actually be just serving as what we call a nectar robber, someone that exploits the flower for its own benefit, but may not actually, at least in these images that we managed to capture, wasn't providing the service or the ecological interaction that had been hypothesized. And so we kept these cameras out. And next slide, please. And as we continued documenting these, as we continued, weeks went by, uh, an entire summer went by, and finally, this uh, fig sphinx, Pachylia ficus, was documented with pollinia. Pollinia is the, a pack of pollen that orchids produce. And here, pollinia from a ghost orchid is affixed to the face of, of this moth. And so either it uh, visited another ghost orchid or extracted it from one of these, but as soon as we saw this, we knew but this was the interaction that we were looking for. And, and this one was a far more uh, valuable or loyal uh, pollinator than, than possibly the giant sphinx. It's not that the giant sphinx moth doesn't necessarily or couldn't necessarily pollinate, but it really opened our eyes to this moth, this species has a much shorter proboscis length than the giant sphinx moth. It's still long, but essentially because it's shorter, it actually forces the moth to dive into the flower more to extract more nectar and in doing so makes the contact that the pollinia from the orchid is transferred to the pollinator and as it visits another flower it's then reaffixed and, and pollinates another flower producing a seed pod and also ultimately new seeds that will grow into new plants. And so this was really mind-blowing for us and as we ruminated on this uh, discovery, we began to think back on previous hypotheses and conversations and the seven years or so that I had spent in the swamp uh, thinking about this and also being based at the Florida Museum of Natural History with massive insect collections, massive collections of butterflies and moths. And in the next slide, you see a selection that working with uh, our curator of, of moths there, Andrei Surikov, we we're really looking at all of the different species that have long proboscis lengths that, that fit into essentially a mid-size. They don't need to be as long as the giant sphinx moth. In fact, maybe they have to be shorter. And, and that's what we started to hone in on. And this uh, selection of moths here, are all these different moths in the South Florida uh, region that could also be serving as pollinators. And so this really opened up a whole new world of hypotheses. And that's what science is all about, is continuing to advance as we gather more and more information and build on our hypotheses and use that to really inform, especially our conservation, and especially in places like corkscrew that are so unique and also represent an environment that is absent, as Mac explained, from the rest of Florida today. Much of my work, uh, prior to this on ghost workers was in the Thakahatchee, which was logged for old growth cypress incredibly hard. And what we're learning here are these complex interactions. It's not just cutting down trees, it's that these ghost orchids, the super ghost at corkscrew is now the highest known individual of the species that we know. But what was that like before those trees were logged? What was this whole other layer of the ecosystem that's now absent? And what are these other ecological interactions between species that we're losing with the degradation of these complex environments. And so with that, I really wanna hand it over to Sean to get into the ecology and the hydrology and the complexity of the old growth cypress swamp at Corkscrew. Great, thank you, Peter. You know, this, this project, aside from being just 
you know, just super nerdy cool. Just, you know, an elusive orchid, this mysterious pollinator. We've got these National Geographic explorers showing up to the swamp, climbing hundreds of feet up into the canopy. Um, you know, aside from all that, it, it was a really amazing collaborative project. And it was a project that's really made me think a lot about Corkscrew's role as a sanctuary. <clears throat> Go ahead, next slide. So Sally showed you a map similar to this at the beginning, but Corkscrew is you know, really a network of conservation lands and both public, private, state, federal, um, it, across South Florida. And it's you know collaborative effort to conserve the biodiversity, the species, and it's projects like this that really help bring partners together and help us each you know really fully utilize the the piece of the puzzle that we are for conserving the unique ecosystems on the, on the southern end of our peninsula. Go ahead, next slide. And, and Corkscrew's got a long history in, or sorry, rather, uh, Audubon has a long history in the Corkscrew Swamp. This is a picture of Rhett Green, who was an Audubon warden who lived within the Corkscrew Swamp in the early 1900s, before National Audubon Society ever owned this land. And uh, Rhett was there to protect a different rat natural resource at the time. He was a deputized warden that was there to protect uh, wood storks that lived within the wood stork uh, rookery within the sanctuary. In advance. Next slide. Mm, so we've seen and overcome several different pressures on Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary over the year, years or on the, the natural resources of the Corkscrew Swamp. Uh, we overcome plume hunting in the early 1900s, which threatened the nesting wading birds, not only in the Corkscrew Swamp, but throughout South Florida. Then in the 1930s and 40s, logging moved into the area and threatened the old growth bald cypress that we continue to this day to work so hard to protect. The logging is what eventually led to Audubon purchasing that property in order to protect that last stand, what is now the last stand of old growth bald cypress. So today, Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary sits at the heart of the 60,000 acre Corkscrew Regional Ecosystem Watershed. And while we've been able to, you know, put a fence around or draw a line around this piece of property in order to conserve it, as land use changes around the sanctuary, and we're seeing more and more development outside the sanctuary, we're starting to see pressures from outside of our borders really impacting what we're trying to conserve within our borders. And right now, one of the biggest threats that we're facing is water. Go ahead and advance. Now, lucky for us, uh, when our early Audubon staff started working at the sanctuary, they started collecting data. They started collecting rainfall and surface water data that every day, daily rainfall and surface water data. This was during a time that Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary was literally in the middle of nowhere. Um, just for context, um, the sanctuary was established in 1954 our staff started collecting data. The oldest data I've been able to find on rainfall and waterfall are about 1957. Um, the city of Naples, which is the, you know, the, the closest city to Corkscrew, didn't even have a bank or a hospital until the 1950s. So this swamp that's protected out in the middle of, of the Everglades, essentially, they were collecting daily data. And Lucky for me, we've been able to use those data to tell the story of what the impact has been over the last 60 years as development has pushed closer to the sanctuary. We're able to use that hydrologic record as a little bit of a, 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 a key to what we've seen, you know, the impacts of what we're seeing change. Go ahead and advance. So this is a picture, I'm gonna show you a couple of these graphs. So I'm gonna explain this one for a minute here. Um, this is a picture of what our daily or our annual hydrology looks like in a typical year. This is a year, the average year back in the 1960s. Across the 
a horizontal axis at the axis at the bottom, you see our hydrologic year, which goes from June 1st to May 31st. So we're not looking at a calendar year here. We're looking at the um, going from our wet season to the dry season. On the uh, vertical axis, you see the, the water depth. How deep is the water at a staff gauge? A staff gauge is essentially a ruler stuck out in one of the deepest parts of the swamp. So what this graph shows us is that in June, July, August, up through October, the swamp is filling up with water. That's when we get, that's our rainy season, when we get most of our rain. And then throughout the rest of the year, you see water levels slowly drop. As water levels are slowly dropping throughout the rest of the year, that's also waiting bird nesting season. So that's a, a, an important uh, tie together for the way this ecosystem works. So this is how things worked back in the 1960s. As we go to the 1970s, we can look at this decade by decade. This is the 1970s, look pretty similar, the 1980s, the 1990s. And then in the 2000s, we saw a really dramatic change. You see that our peak is higher and that we're drying all the way down into the, the, in the dry season. If we go to the 2010s, you see that this pattern is even more dramatic. And then finally, if we click one more time, we can put the 1960s and the 2010s side by side. And you can really see what that change that we've seen looks like. In the wet season, in that you know, October, September period, we still see the, the swamp fill up with water in the same way that it did historically. But it's in the dry season that we're really losing water. And we can see this out in the swamp. Go ahead and click to the next slide. We can see this in the hydro period of some of our habitats. If we look at that, the hydro period is the number of days different wetland habitats have water above ground. So we've seen since the 1960s, the hydro period of our freshwater marsh decreased by almost 30%. Our bald cypress by 18% and our pond habitats like the lettuce lakes that you can see from the boardwalk, the, the hydro period is 17% shorter. Go ahead and advance. You can also see this when you go out to the lettuce lakes. If, if you're familiar with corkscrew and love to go out on the boardwalk, you're familiar with what the lettuce lakes look like. If you go out during the dry season in recent years, you'll see that it's dried down. And it usually dries down in that kind of April, May, early June period. In the 1960s to the 1990s, the lettuce lakes dried down about once every five years. What we've seen since 2000 is that we're drying down about four out of every five years. And when we do dry down, those dry downs are lasting about 40% longer. Go ahead and advance. So what are the implications of losing this water during the dry season? Losing water in the dry season means we're losing the standing water underneath the cypress trees, we're losing that standing water that buffers temperature when we get cold fronts that come through in the winter. We're losing that standing water that um, creates the proper humidity that our epiphytes and other plants need to survive. <clears throat> We're losing um, the, the standing water that is home to alligators and fish and it, it disrupts, wetlands are dependent on water and losing that water in the dry, dry season really disrupts that nat natural balance in some way or another for most you know, members of this ecosystem. Next slide. Not coincidentally, since we've seen this change in hydrology, we've seen the number of wood stork nests that the number of wood stork nests within the corkscrew colony decrease. This is probably due to a number of factors changing in our region. Uh, but we suspect that one of the key factors is water loss. When we reduce the hydro period, we're producing fewer fish. These wading birds depend on fish to eat. We're also losing alligators underneath those trees, and those alligators actually help guard wood stork nests. So we definitely see an inter interdependence of all of these different factors. Next slide. So in addition to implications for our plants and our wildlife, we also have implications for our ecosystem. Drying the swamp down in the winter uh, puts the, makes Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary vulnerable to devastating wildfires that could come in and threaten the integrity, threaten to change what, what Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary looks like for all of us. 
We also know that the standing water within the sanctuary is important for recharging our aquifer and for cleaning and sending that fresh water to our coasts and helping with that delicate salinity balance that drives the ecosystem in our estuaries and then all the way out on our coastline. Next slide. So what are we doing about it? Well, the first step that we have taken on this, um, we have been working over the past year on a hydrologic modeling project in order to better understand the magnitude of some of the potential causes of our water loss. We're, we have partnered with um, the South Florida Water Management District's Big Cypress Basin and are, have uh, contracted uh, Water Science Associates as um, the modeling as the modelers to do this. And we're looking at um, basically looking at what's the relative impact of groundwater withdrawals, both from agriculture, from residential, from landscape. What is the role of the canals in our system and, and the way that we move water around in the wet season that could be potentially impacting the sanctuary. And then finally, we've seen changes in plant communities across our landscape. We know that some plants that um, only evapotranspirate a small amount of water are being replaced with bigger woodier plants that evapotranspirate a lot of water. So what's the impact of that when we mag you know, multiply it across the landscape? So we're trying to get a, you know, get a sense of, of where our problem is so that we can then try to stop this water loss and hopefully be able to reverse it. Next slide. So finally, you know, taking a view of the sphinx moth as it is coming in to, to pollinate the ghost orchid, you can look down below in this picture and see water, standing water underneath those old growth bald cypress trees. And we know that that water drives the ecology of our, our ecosystem. This project was able to bring together um, the pure joy of scientific exploration. It built upon you know, excellent collaboration with our partners, uh, partners that share the same passion for conservation that we do. And it's helped us put some of the pieces together of our ecosystem. And you know, this ecology is really just a big jigsaw puzzle where we're trying to understand the ways that things are connected. Because when one thing gets you know, kind of knocked out of whack, we need to understand the implications and try to reverse it in order to conserve that ecosystem. So we're trying to understand it better. And you know, all of that is working together to really try to protect, conserve, restore wherever possible uh, this ecosystem and the sanctuary that we all care so much about. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much, Sean. And thank you for everyone um, for coming to, to see this webinar and also for our speakers. I do want to give a quick shout out to uh, a photographer at the beginning of the presentation, RJ Wiley, who has gifted us a few of his ghost orchid photos. Just thank you so much for that. And we have time for a few questions. We won't get to all the questions, but we'll get to as many as possible. First, for Peter, can you just repeat the name of the moth that you thought was doing the pollinating and then the moth that you discovered was probably actually doing the pollinating? We had a bunch of questions about what their names were. So the one that was hypothesized before this was the giant sphinx moth. And then the image that we showed was the fig sphinx that has the pollinia um, attached to the head. And, and essentially that was what opened up our um, hypotheses that many more would likely be able to pollinate as well. Awesome. And this question is going to be, um, I'll ask Mac first and then Peter. So you took some pretty amazing photographs of what your uh, field work looks like. So for you, what is the most difficult part of doing this kind of field work? And what is the most rewarding part of doing this kind of field work in this ecosystem? Well, um, you know, Peter and I had this conversation several times while we were working on this, because uh, Peter had been working for several years on the Fakahatchee, uh, which wasn't too far away from, from Corkscrew. And then when we started working in Audubon uh, Corkscrew Swamp, he was saying, oh my God, there's a boardwalk here. We can just, <laughs> we can haul out our gear with like rolly bags. So it's kind of hard for me to say that anything was too difficult uh, because I didn't have to suffer through uh, months in the field in Fakahatchee. Um, and plus the Audubon 
resources at, at Corkscrew were so strong uh, that it really made doing this just such a pleasure. Um, and I, so I don't know, the difficult parts just in terms of technologically um, were, were immense. You know, we had thousands of false triggers uh, having to climb up trees and replace batteries. Uh, so you're sitting there just like working on really small things and unscrewing screws from your sensors and hoping that you don't drop things out of the tree because um, it's just be impossible to find if you did that. So I guess that was the most uh, difficult part. Uh, we're all pretty used to mosquitoes and heat and all that. So none of that really factored in for us, or at least for me, for what was difficult. It was just all about like the small, technical things. The most rewarding part uh, was was really getting, you know, having an idea start as just a little seed and it, it growing into something uh, as profound and significant as this and working with your friends and your partners in a place that is very meaningful. And it's so rare too. the fact that, you know, this is all happening in an old growth forest and getting to see this forest in, in such a unique way. Uh, was very rewarding. I mean, you know, I wanted to do this stuff since I was like eight years old. So <laughs> like, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very rewarding to do. And I have to thank Audubon for, for trusting us with it and uh, allowing us to, to continue this work. Peter? Absolutely. Yeah, I, uh, the interesting concept of this is that Mac and I do field work in this aspect for a living. And so it's when you start to step back from it, you realize that um, this is absolutely working in our comfort zones, but it's not necessarily for everyone. I think the challenging part for this that Mac and I really thrive on is one, we couldn't be more passionate about uh, so many aspects of this work, but it's layering. Um, you you're in a flooded forest uh you know 50 to 90 to 100 feet up at night with electronics um in like clouds of mosquitoes and so it's it is something that you get used to over time but it's the layering of i i guess like the technical aspects of this work and being accustomed in the environment to operate proficiently in all those different scenarios and that just really comes with um, a lot of years in the swamp and a significant passion for the swamp that you really just endure whatever it takes and you actually thrive off of it and love it. And it's not, um, it, you know, you at the end of the day, I think Mac and I working together was just this, uh, you know, collision of, of complementary skill sets and, every day in the field at Corkscrew because of what the facilities enabled with the boardwalk, with like the staff and the research facilities there um, and, and even more, we were able to come back every single night walking on the boardwalk and just bouncing ideas off of each other. And, you know, that shot that Mac showed of the light trap in the canopy, um, that whole concept was something that I had like sketched out a million different times and just wasn't the right combination of people or, or whatever. But after the lightning shot that Mac shared, we were walking back on the boardwalk and I was just like, Hey, I've always had this crazy idea. What if we were to take this a hundred feet up into the treetops? And so for me, that was the rewarding thing of sometimes these really challenging uh, issues or problems or questions sometimes you really need to think outside of the box, but it's this combination of the right people, the right passion, the right um, infrastructure and support combined with, in this case, the advancement of technology in recent years for the cameras to get to the level where they were now proficient enough to, to operate in this fine scale. So we could go on and on forever about uh, working in field environments, but that's a quick response. Thank you. Sally, we had a question for you. How old is the ghost orchid, do we think? Um, we've heard estimates from various orchid experts that it's probably about 60 years old, maybe a little younger, maybe a little bit older. What about uh, a related question for Sally? What about the old growth bald cypress in the, in the swamp, swamp <laughs> sanctuary? 
What about it? It is on an old growth called cypress tree. It's about six. Sorry, I meant to, I meant to ask how uh, how old those trees were, and I got distracted. So yes, how oh, old? Oh, okay. We don't know exactly how old our oldest tree is, but the estimates are about 400 to 600 years old for the oldest trees there. Awesome. Of course, course since an ancient forest, there is various aged trees, but the oldest ones are about that old. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Sean, we had a question about uh, alligators. Can you elaborate a little bit on the alligator wood stork relationship? Sure. Um, well, this is something that has been noticed and noted for years that, you know, if you have standing water in South Florida during wading bird nesting season, if you have standing water that has alligators in it with a tall tree in the middle, that wood storks will come and nest on it. And there's always been this question about, you know, is that a coincidental? Is it just that alligators like the same water conditions as wood storks? Um, things like that. But what recent research has showed using decoy alligators is that those wood storks are actually looking for alligators in order to nest in trees above where alligators are. The purpose of that, we think, is because um, it's, it's essentially a mutualism. The, the wood storks' nests are guarded by um, the alligators. Egg predators like raccoons can't swim across the water, climb the tree, and get the, neck, the eggs or the nestlings. Um, and at the same time, those alligators are benefiting from anything that happens to fall out of those nests, whether it's leftover fish, you know, um, baby chicks, you know, anything that falls out of those nests, the alligators are there to catch. So it's a really interesting um, relationship. And, you know, there's a lot of places, even, you know, alligator farms where you can see wood storks nesting because wood storks love to nest in trees above alligators. Awesome. There was a, another question for Mac and Peter. What else did you see up there when you were way, way up at the tippy tops of those trees? Well, um, lots of things. Several times I had an owl just land right next to me, uh, maybe like 10 feet away and just kind of, you know, be like, what are you, what are you doing up here? Of course, we saw the giant sphinx moth while climbing up uh, the tree called the Calusa in Corkscrew. We even found a, another ghost orchid, uh, which is really exciting. Another ghost orchid that's probably about 40 feet up or so. Um, so that's really cool. We saw all kinds of things, lots of orchids. Uh, it's just a fascinating, just a fascinating view. I mean, consider going out on the ocean on a boat, right? versus actually going and scuba diving. Like it's a, just a totally different world when you when you climb up there. Um, so yeah, Peter, you got anything else to add? I would say the same. I mean, for me, tree climbing in tropical forests, it's, it's about the perspective in so many different ways. We, one, it's amazing to have that vantage point to see wildlife in the canopy like Mac was talking about. For me, the thing that Complete. I, I love the scuba diving analogy. Um, the concept is really, you know, you live your entire life looking up into the treetops and to actually be in the treetops looking down on this whole environment and understanding it from a different perspective. It just shifts the dynamic of how you think about the complexity of these environments. It, you know, gives you a different perspective from which to just you know, observe and to witness and to think about how these forests function. So it was a real privilege to, you know, have the support of Audubon to climb these old growth trees because that was just such a remarkable experience. We have a lot of questions about when the orchid blooms. Sally, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, well, most orchids bloom in the summer. Typically, July is the most prolific month for blooms on any ghost orchid. Um, but our particular ghost orchid has bloomed every single month of the year. Um, but its most heavy blooming is in the summer, typically in July and August. Um, last week, we still had a few flowers on the orchid. Um, I'm not sure since I'm not there right now how many are on there right now. Um, but it did produce um, about 30 flowers this summer. And another question that's been frequently asked, and I'm not sure who to, to ask it to, so I'll just put it out for the four of you. People are just generally curious, how many ghost orchids are out there? 
either on Corkscrew or just in South Florida in general? You know, are people doing surveys or, or how do we know? I can do that one or doesn't matter. Yeah, go for um, it. It's, it's, it's thought to be around 2000 or so. Um, there are different groups of researchers and park biologists throughout Southwest Florida working on all of the different um, populations to, to monitor individuals over the years. Um, there are hundreds in Fakahatchee, Big Cypress, the Panther Refuge, and other parts of Southwest Florida, but it's thought to be just around 2,000 um, in Florida. Gotcha. Uh, is the team planning future research on the ghost orchid? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We're not planning. I'm not planning uh, to shoot any more uh, on it. Um, but you never know. It's just all it takes is one little wild hair and someone planting the seed of an idea and it could happen. Yeah, I won't say no, but I think my answer was no before uh, this whole endeavor in 2018 when we were deploying these. I was, I'd spent so many years and I was uh, officially, you know, retired from this and then Mac brought me out of retirement. So um, I'm not going to say never, but Mac and I continue to scheme different ideas and certainly, um, you know, any opportunity to continue doing research at Corkscrew um, is a huge honor. So. Hopefully we can scheme up something new. And I'll add too that, you know, the, the Sanctuaries Research Program supports an active um, group of visiting researchers. So if, you know, we're approached by others who want to, you know, study some other aspect of, of ghost orchids, we certainly evaluate all uh, research proposals that come to us. And so even if these guys decide to move on to, to something else or somewhere else, um, we are always open to collaborating on new projects at the sanctuary. Is the ghost orchid fragrant? Yes. Um, and, and that's actually at nighttime, many flowers that are pollinated at night have different ways of luring in um, their pollinators. And so, for these ghost orchids, it's, uh, they're using these volatile compounds, these chemical cues that they're emitting from further away. And then the white, the creamy, yellowish, greenish uh, color oftentimes helps to, uh, in a visual sense, for pollinators to hone in on a closer range. And that white color is you know, reflecting ambient light from maybe the moon or just the night sky. Uh, so it's a combination of factors, but yes, they are fragrant for sure. This question was asked three times, once on Facebook and twice in Zoom. It can go to everybody because everyone works in this environment. How do you deal with all of the biting insects when you are out doing your work? Long Cover sleeves. up. <laughs> Cover up every piece of you you can. <laughs> Yeah, the tricky thing with a lot of insect repellents is that they eat away at plastic and electronics and things like that. And also, you know, wading in the water and, and all of these different things, uh, we tend to just cover up or not, um, but you get, you get used to it um, one way or another. Awesome. Uh, Sean, I have a question for you. You know, you talked about the hydrology and the changing hydrology someone lives in the area or is interested in the area, you know, how can they help? How can they be a part of the solution? I think the simplest solution, and, and it's something, if you think about growing up, I grew up outside of Florida, and we always talked about water conservation. And I feel like right now in South Florida, we're not talking enough about water conservation. And so just being aware of personal household water use, um, things like xeriscaping, trying to reduce or eliminate water use on your, for landscaping. Um, I, I think those are all ways that any, you know, resident could um, be more conscious about and help conserve water. If you want to, um, 
you know, on a bigger level in terms of initiatives that are being done regionally, Audubon has lots of resources where you can tune in and, um, you know, make sure you're signed up for the newsletter, be aware of other um, uh, projects and policy um, uh, initiatives that would support water conservation measures and, and responsible water usage in our region. But I think those would, um, from landscaping, just everyday household water conservation to just being aware of kind of the regional decisions being made for our water, kind of the three big ways I could think. Great, and this is gonna be our last question. Why is it called a ghost orchid? It is an epiphytic orchid um, that has no leaves once it's established and it doesn't really look like much most of the year. They're hard to find on the trees because all they are are roots. They can photosynthesize through their roots. It's when they bloom that they get the name the ghost orchid from because the, the flowers just kind of stick out there in space and float around like little ghosts. And there's other common names for the orchid. That's just the most commonly used one. Yeah, that one's the most fun, I would say. Well, thank you all so much. This has been really great. Thank you all for your amazing questions. You can find out more about Corkscrew at um, corkscrew.audubon.org. Just as a reminder, this has been recorded. It will be available on Facebook underneath our video section. It will also be available in the next few days on Audubon Florida's website under our educational webinars tab. Thank you so much to our presenters and to everyone else. Have an amazing evening.